that. <laughs> Welcome to our latest webinar titled Notary Knowledge. You are going to test your knowledge of notary topics by answering questions on the screen. Your answers are anonymous and right or wrong, this is a learning experience. Our presentation will start with a question and then be followed by an explanation. When we have finished with the questions and the explanations, you will have a chance to ask your questions, but please do not add your questions to the chat box until after the presentation is complete. Let's begin with John's presentation. Thanks, Brian. So my name is John Morensel. Brian Crocker is along with me, both PAN instructors. And we're excited for this uh, webinar called Notary Knowledge because it is, unlike any one we've ever done before, it is more interactive. And at the end, I think you're going to like this style and maybe you want to see more like this. So hopefully you enjoyed today's presentation. Um, before we start, I just want to make sure you realize that you are muted and you're not going to be able to talk to us uh, through audio, but there is a way you will be able to ask your questions. Um, what you're going to use is the chat box. You can pull up the chat box by clicking on the chat box icon that can be found in the middle of the toolbar. Uh, typically, the toolbar is either at the bottom or the top of your screen. Just depends on the type of device you're using to participate today. And like Brian mentioned earlier, please, if you can, please save your questions until after the presentation is over. We're gonna have plenty of time for to answer your questions and then you'll have a chance to put them in the chat box. Um, when they come in throughout the presentation, the chat box does scroll up. And a lot of times we lose the questions and we don't wanna miss your questions. So if you save it until, we, um, until the end, that would be greatly appreciated. So, Let's do a quick icebreaker to start off today's webinar. And this will kind of give you an idea on how we will be voting on the polls today. So remember, these are anonymous, but here's our icebreaker. Let me know how long you've been a notary. So during the icebreaker portion, I usually give about a minute so everybody can vote. After the minute is up, I will end the poll and share the results. So it kind of shows everybody what everybody came up with. Give about another 15 seconds. Remember, these votes are anonymous. More participation, the better, I'd say. All right, so that is a full minute. I'm going to end the poll, share the results, and, and pretty much like all the other webinars, the leader in this was a one to four years. That wins at 42%. Five to eight years is at 25%. We have nine to 12 years at 15%. And then a big mix of 5% and 17 to 20. And then 4% tie with three-way tie at the end there for 13 to 16 years, 21 to 24 years, and 25 plus years. So there's tons of experience in the room. So that is good to know. So let's go ahead and start with our first scenario. So here's scenario one. Your boss drops off a document on your desk that he signed already with a note saying, Please notarize this before the end of the day, and then goes back to his office. What would you do? So let me go ahead and pull up the poll question, and then there's going to be three options. Let me know what you would do in this scenario. Remember, I keep reminding, but these are anonymous. I know a lot of people get shy if you're unsure of the answer, so you don't want to vote, but we don't know who votes for what. So give it a try and see what... Um, so we can see what you come up with. Another 20 seconds.
All right, so that is our full minute. What I'm gonna do now is post the results. So we're gonna share them on the screen. 81% of us in the room said that you would ask him to come back so you can notarize the document while he's in front of you. We have 12% of the room said you would call him and ask if he signed it. And if he did, you would then notarize it. And then 7% said notarize the document for him. You know his signature, so it's okay. So the majority got it right. 81% of us got the correct answer. Um, and let me explain why. So I'm gonna stop sharing the results. So if the results screen is still on your screen, you just need to click the X button on it and it will remove from the screen. So for an in-person notarization, whether you know the customer signature or not, the customer needs to be in front of you when you're performing the notarization. Personal appearance should be in the same room, face-to-face -face at the time of the notarization. Good rule of thumb, have them within arm's length of you. You should be able to exchange physical information like the documents and the ID with the customer. All right, let's check out another scenario here. A customer walks into your office with the document and they want you to notarize it. You ask for ID and they hand you an expired PA driver's license. From the photo on the driver's license, you can tell it's obviously the customer. What would you do? So once again, I'm gonna put up that question and three possible answers. Let me know what you would do in this situation. about another 30 seconds. All right, that's our full minute. So let's end the poll. And what we're gonna do now is share the results. And wow, we have 95% of us said that you would ask for another form of acceptable ID. 3% said you would accept the presented ID. 2% said ask for a credit or a debit card with the name on it. If the name match, you could accept it. So 95% of us, you came up with the correct answer. It's an awesome job. If you did not get it correct, don't beat yourself up over this. Like Brian said earlier, it is a learning experience. So hopefully you're taking information away from today. That is the goal. So let's stop sharing the results and explain why that is the correct answer. So when you accept an ID as a way to identify the customer, the ID needs to meet certain criteria. It needs to be government issued. It needs to be current which means not expired. Even by one day, we cannot take it. It needs to contain a signature or a photograph. It doesn't need both for the notary law here in Pennsylvania, Rulona. Only one is required. And then on top of all those things, it needs to be satisfactory to you, the notary. All right, let's check out our third scenario. Your customer brings you a document. How would you determine which notary act to perform for the customer? Let's check out that poll question and the three possibilities. So let me know how you would determine the notary act. about another 30 seconds.
All right, that is the full minute. We're going to shut down that poll and let's share the results. So looking at the results, we had 86% of the room said you would determine the notary act by finding the notary statement on the document. 14% uh, said you would by the title of the document. And nobody, that's the first time um, since we've been doing these this week, did not choose the third option where it said it doesn't matter what the notary act is. You're just there to stamp and sign it. So the majority, again, 86% of us got the correct answer. Um, it's by the notary statement on the document. So let me stop sharing. And again, I'll explain why. In order to notarize a document for your customer, you need to find the notary wording that's on the document. Let's go over a scenario on how to properly notarize a document. Now, what we're going to do here is we're going to use these two handouts that are on the screen for this scenario. We have the notary responsibilities flowchart and the notary wording handout. If you would like these handouts, we're going to upload them into the chat box where you'll have the opportunity to download them. And Brian's uploading them right now. So thank you, Brian. So the first three steps are typically the same when performing a notarization. You demand personal appearance and ID the customer. Then you will review the document for blanks and the notary wording. We're not, um, we're not there to read the customer's document word for word. We're just there to scan it over. The only blanks I noticed when I scanned this uh, document was in the customer's portion of the document. And it's when it came to their name, date, in the borrower number. We're gonna have the customer fill that information in before we notarize. Next, when I scanned, I would see if I noticed if there's any notary wording on the document. Now, when I was scanning the document, I noticed there was notary wording. I see the venue and I see the notary statement. Now that I know that there's a notary statement on the document, we need to determine which notary act we're working with. Now, bring in the notary wording handout. It's as simple as this. Let's play the match game and match up these statements. The notary statement on the document matches up with the verification on oath wording that we see here on the notary wording handout. So that's how I know I'm working with the verification on oath or affirmation. Perhaps some of us out there thought that the notary act we needed to perform was an acknowledgement because of the title listed here on the document. This is not the case. PAN recommends ignoring titles when you're searching for your notary wording. Titles can be extremely misleading. The way to determine the notary act that needs to be performed will be from the notary statement that is on the document. So once you know the notary act that needs to be performed, you want to follow the steps from the flowchart to complete the act. Since we found verification on oath wording, the first thing that we want to do is administer an oath to our customer and listen for their affirmative response. The oath could be something as simple as, do you swear or affirm that the information in this document is true? Make sure to get an affirmative response from the customer before moving on. After the oath, you wanna make sure you watch your customer sign the document. So we watch Frank Johnson sign it and fill in the other information. Once the customer signs, we need to compare the signature that's on the document to the signature that's on the ID that was presented to us. If we have any doubts or concerns when comparing the signatures, as the notary, we have right to refuse service. Next, we need to complete our notary wording. First, we'll fill in the venue with the state and the county where the notarization is taking place. And lastly, we'll fill in the notary statement with the date of the notarization, and we will hand print our customer's name after the word by. We will then place our stamp and signature on the document. And before the customer leaves, we will make sure we make our journal entry. And here's an image of what our journal entry would have looked like. All right, so let's check out scenario four. So your customer brings you a document with no notary wording on it. How would you go about notarizing it for the customer? Let me launch up the poll and it will give you three options. How would you go about notarizing it for them?
about another 30 seconds on this one. All right, so that is our full minute. Let's end the poll and let's share the results. So we got a mixed crowd here on this one. 49% um, said that they would read over the document and decide what Notary Act the customer needs. We had 48%, so it's almost a coin flip here. Um, they would have the customer decide which Notary Act they want. And then 3% said, Pick the Notary Act for the customer only if the customer allows us to. So I'm going to uh, let us know which one is correct. And believe it or not, the majority did not win this one. 48% of us said have the customer decide what, which Notary Act they want. That is the correct answer. So let me explain why. So I'm going to stop sharing the results here. Let's say you scan over your customer's document and you don't find notary wording on it. You don't see a venue and you don't see one of these notary statements. Unless you're an attorney, you cannot decide which notary act the customer wants. But if the customer can tell you which notary act they want, you can add the proper wording to the document and perform the notarization for them. The second part of that notary wording handout we've been using today has a section called no notary wording. You can use this with your customer to help them to decide which Notary Act they want. If the customer can decide which Notary Act they want, add the proper wording to the document and notarize following the flowchart. If the customer cannot decide what Notary Act they want, you should refuse to notarize and recommend that they seek advice from an attorney. To show you step-by-step -step how to add notary wording, check out a prior webinar that we held called No Notary Wording. This can be found on Pan's YouTube page. So to find this, you just need to be on YouTube and in the search bar, you would search for Pennsylvania Association of Notaries. There you will see a handful of prior webinars and also tutorials and how-to videos. So if you haven't done so already, I highly recommend giving that page a like or a follow. So you are notified when we are uploading our most recent videos. Last scenario here, we have scenario five. Your customer brings you a document that needs to be notarized three times. How would you complete your journal? So here is our last poll. Go ahead, go ahead and read over the three options and let me know how you would complete your journal. We got about another 20 seconds on this one. All right, so that is our full minute. Let's end the poll and let's share the results. 89% of us in the room said you would record three separate journal entries. 6% said you would record the journal entry once, then put times three in the remarks section. And 4% said record the journal entry once, then put ditto marks for the next two entries where the information is the same. So the majority wins this one at 89%. Yeah, the correct answer is record three separate journal entries so let's explain why. Each placement of your official stamp warrants a separate journal entry. You cannot write 
times three in the remark section because all the information is the same. You do not want to use ditto marks where the information is the same. If you're notarizing three times, the proper thing to do is make three separate journal entries. The saying we use a pan is one stamp equals one journal entry. All right, to summarize here, always demand personal appearance. Then you wanna make sure you properly ID the customer. Review the document for proper notary wording and do not decide the notary act for the customer. And finally, make sure you're recording in your journal properly before the customer leaves. Remember, one stamp equals one journal entry. So that's it for our presentation. Let's open the floor to the questions. And while we're waiting for the first question to pop in, I will let you know that if you are watching this on YouTube, you're not gonna be able to see the chat box, but we will repeat the questions. Is the journal time start or finish time. The law doesn't actually state one way or the other that it, whether it's start or finish time, uh, I would pick your choice and be consistent. Agreed. Donna's name looks familiar. I think she might have just signed up for one of my future notary seminars or maybe i'm crazy is that true donna nod your head <laughs> all right so claire asks how do you verify the identity of a minor um i mean an a uh, minor could apply to get a identification card not many do but they can um if they don't you could use personal knowledge um, if you don't personally know that minor, then one way is a credible witness. So the credible witness is always used as a method of last resort. Um, so the credible witness acts as the middleman. They need to personally know the notary and that customer um, personally. They need to swear out a verification on oath by a credible witness. So that's a paper document. They're swearing to the ID of the customer you would notarize that, and that would give you t the okay to, original, uh, to notarize for that original customer, which is the minor. Marissa asks, once you are sworn in as a notary, what are the next steps to becoming an issuing agent? When, when you become an issuing agent, you're starting a business and you're signing a contract with PennDOT. Uh, Penn does help you become a notary. We unfortunately do not walk you through the steps of becoming uh, an issuing agent. But there is information on our website uh, which can help you uh, keep your mind straight and keep all of your documents straight when it comes time to contact PennDOT. Now, right off the top of my head, I'm not sure how to get there, but let me bring up the website. And on our website, if you click on products. And after you click on products, click on motor vehicle packets. And then there are a number of choices at the top of the screen. Card agent, full agent, messenger, dealer, salvor, miscellaneous, uh, MV business. And you would pick the one that you want to become. Uh, I don't recommend necessarily printing right away because these are hundred. This is, these are over a hundred pages. I had a private question roll in. It says, is training time available for this? Now, this was right after the journal question and um, the ID question. So I'm not sure which one they're referring to. If you're asking if there's training time available for the journal information, um, I was going to say, I don't know. if uh, Do me this, Tara. Please clarify your question to me. Um, or put it in the chat box to everybody, and then we could answer that. Um, I'll take Colleen's question. It said, 
journal entry for ID, do you have to write the date issued? Um, if they're for the acceptable ID, if it has an issue and expiration date, those need to be written in the journal. I don't know how I skipped your question. <laughs> that happens. Question from Carol. In your journal, if you're notarizing a deed and there are five people and they have to sign for the transfer, uh, do you make a separate journal entry for each person uh, if it's only one notary stamp? Interesting that that question should come up because I have a visual for you, but it's going to involve me sharing my screen. It may take me a couple of moments here. There we go. You're going to see my notes for a second. And then I'm going to be able to do hopefully that. There we go. Now, this isn't five people. This is two people, but, but it'll give you an idea of what we're talking about. So with the two people, it, uh, the first example, it, it shows that the notary knew both of the parties personally. So it was really easy to get all of the information about both customers on one line. I'm thinking that's probably not going to be possible for five people. So the second option is more likely to work for you. So what you can do is you can use a separate line for each signer, keeping in mind, this is still one notarization, the X's over the line number below the main line number on each of the lines you use uh, is an indication of the fact that it is one notarization. Um, and the drawing the line through the spaces that you don't use is another indication that it goes with the entry above. So I'm thinking this is gonna be your best bet when recording it in your journal. Let me stop sharing. And you know what, if you want this, I'm, I'm gonna ask you right now, I can't share it with you because it's a part of our presentation, but I'm, I'm, I don't know if you take a, a picture of it with your smartphone. So I'll give you a few seconds to do that and then I'll stop sharing. Very smart. Um, so Marissa asked, do you offer the education? Um, and she was referring to her previous question about being an issuing agent. Um, yeah, we are PennDOT approved to teach motor vehicles. So we have basic and advanced classes are basic. Um, we don't go many places. We typically teach those in Pittsburgh. And once or twice a year, we go to Altoona for the basic. But we do have tons of advanced courses that we travel around. But we also are, we have an online course that is approved for PennDOT. So that is something to consider. Do the names of witnesses need to be noted in the journal? It depends. Uh, if you are notarizing the signatures of the witnesses, those are separate notarizations and they would need to be listed separately and they would be the customer. If you have witnesses that are plainly signing, their signatures are not being notarized, we recommend that you record their names over in maybe the remarks section as additional information, but that's not required. How do I become a remote notary and able to do electronic notarization? So what I'm doing is this. I, a, I just clicked enter. So in the chat box, there is a link. That link is gonna give you information about being an electronic notary and or a remote online notary. That link is probably a day's worth of reading, and there is no way possible to tell you everything about eNotary and RON in one webinar. So I would recommend checking that link out. That's going to explain the differences. It's going to explain how to sign up, the state approved vendors. Um, it's going to give you all that information. So I think that link is going to be where you want to check out if you have any interest. Malene asks, when you get a document to notarize and the document has a venue from another state, for example, New Jersey, do you just strike out New Jersey and uh, write in Pennsylvania? Actually, yes. The venue is supposed to reflect where the document is being notarized. So if it says New Jersey and one of the counties in New Jersey, don't ask me, I don't know, you would put a line through New Jersey, you would print Pennsylvania, you would put a line through uh, whatever the county name is in New Jersey, and you would print the name of a county that you are actually 
notarizing in. Let me thank you for giving them the opportunity to take a picture. They like that. Um, Angela says, can you serve as both the witness and a notary for the same document if the witness signature is not being notarized? So there are two instances where you cannot be both. Um, one, you just explained. Yeah, if the witness's signature was being notarized, you couldn't do it. So that's a good step. Um, if the document is a power of attorney, then you can't. So that's the other stipulation. So as long as your the witness's signature is not being notarized, nor it's a power of attorney, you technically could be both. If you have other people to be the witnesses, I think that's the better way to go about it. For it doesn't draw eyes to the document, doesn't draw questions, but sometimes you're stuck in a bind and you need to be both. So technically you could. And Angela, I'm glad you asked that question because it reminds me that um, I and some of the other people at PAN are, are building a frequently asked questions database on the website. It's, it's replacing the notarization and coronavirus uh, question and answer section on the blog. It's, it's a slow progress, but that is one of the questions that's already out there about being a witness and a notary on the same document. Yeah, I think out of the three webinars, I think we've had that question in all three webinars. So Absolutely. Yeah, that is something very common. It's so, a very common yeah. question. I know customer yeah. service gets it a lot. So we are open to more questions. We're only 32 minutes into our time allotment. But we do have a very small group today, probably about half the size or maybe less than half the size of this morning's. And Thursday, I can't remember the number, maybe a quarter of that size. That was the big one. <laughs> Thursdays, we couldn't even, we didn't answer all the questions. No, we ran we out of time. Had a bunch of questions in the chat box after the hour. What should I look over to, to prepare uh, for my exam uh, coming up soon? Uh, Marissa, here's the thing. We, in our first time notary seminar and our first time notary seminar live online, we hand out what's called Rulona Rundown. That's a quick guide to potential questions that could be on the exam. Uh, we also offer you access to our online test preparation tutorial. That's another thing. And the third thing that, that John has recommended in the past, and I don't think is a, is a bad idea, if you look in the back of the workbook for the first time notary seminar is a complete mm -hmm. reprint of the notary law. Uh, it's not an easy read, but it's not that many pages either. So glance over it. I mean, honestly, when, when, you when you take that course, we don't have enough time even in three hours to cover all the information. Um, if I move my home address, do I need to report it to PAN or at the courthouse? My office record is gonna be the same. Um, so if you're a PAN member, contact us. We'll help you with the change. Um, so what you're required by law is you need to file a change within 30 days um, with the Department of State. The PAN will assist you on that. And then there are times you need to do changes with the county, but if your office of records not leaving what county to go to a new county, um, you don't need to really notify them. And if there is a time you would need to notify them, PAN would give you the heads up on that. Can you notarize a power of attorney if the notice is missing? The law in Pennsylvania does require uh, a notice and an agent's acknowledgement, which is not a notary acknowledgement. Uh, unfortunately, if I, if I answer that question, I'm practicing law without a license. So my recommendation in this particular case is that you, you seek the services of an attorney at law. If you're ever unsure of whether you can notarize something or not, you can always refuse to serve. Please say again where the test prep is available. Thanks. So typically you get an email from PAN. It's an automated email. So I check your spam or junk folder a week after you take education with PAN if you're required to take the exam. Now, if you didn't get it, that happens from time to time, you know, with technology. So where you can go is this, you can log into the member portal on our website. On the left-hand side, it says tutorials. If you click on that, it's gonna say, um, Merlona test prep course. 
you click on that and that's what you can um you could do that over and over again if they haven't moved it around it's on the bottom line yeah lots of good questions right now yeah um you have more definitely ask this is definitely the time to do it I'm going to share something in the chat box. If I can make my old fingers work. There we go. Bring that back up. So if after we're finished, you still have questions, here's our shared email address, instructors at notary.org. What are some questions you might ask to assess an elderly person's understanding of what they are signing? I have a great example, but it's going to be specific to the document, Claire. Normally, a notary is not responsible to read or understand a document. But when you're assessing an elder, elderly person's understanding, I do recommend that you read it to get a, a pretty good understanding of what the document's all about. And this is how you turn it around. You look at the customer and you ask them to explain the effect of the document. For example, what effect will this document have on you when you sign it? And if they can answer the question uh, and you're comfortable with their answer, then I would move forward. But the question should be open-ended. You don't wanna ask something that could be answered with a yes or a no. You don't wanna say, does this document give your son the power over you to do X, Y, and Z? because the person can just say yes or no, and you're not really assessing their understanding. Glenn asks, um, can you put back up the journal entry examples you showed earlier for the mortgage with two names notarized? How did I miss that? I think you were typing. Um, I missed it, know. yeah, okay. Yeah. Let, me, let me bring it up. Again, bear with me, because you're gonna see a lot of garbage on the screen until I share, there it is. Get your cell phone out, snap a picture. I'm not making fun of you. You know, people ask for the copies of our PowerPoints all the time, and we've been told we're not allowed to share them because they're our, our intellectual property. But I watch people in seminars all the time snapping pictures. I've watched people uh, on a Google seminar or rather on a Zoom seminar. I can see them taking pictures. Uh, you know what? If that helps you, go for it. Agreed. Definitely agree. I don't see it. Do you think it's a problem just to leave that up, John? No, not at all. Why don't we just leave it up for now? Because I, you're not sharing anything anyway. Mm -hmm. But I lost my chat box. There it is. So keep in mind, there will be this replay on YouTube at some point next week. So if you want to go back through this to see the presentation again, or go through the Q&A portion, um, that's where you will see it. Um, What's the renewal process being we're still in the pandemic? Um, let me try to cipher, decipher, decipher what you mean. Um, notaries are, are still required to apply and become notaries every four years. The state is appointing notaries currently. You want to apply before your commission expires. If you don't, then you would need to take a notary exam, which is something that you don't want to do as a reappointment. Uh, once you've been reappointed, you'll get an email from the Department of State with a notice to appointee attached and also a blank bond. The notice to appointee says you have 45 days to get your bond completed, to go to the recorder's office, and to register your signature with the prothonotary. Um, I would contact those two offices before you go because some, um, I'm guessing that a lot of them are open to the public now. Uh, some are still offering some type of virtual swearing in, but we're going full, full bore right now. Yep. Um, are you allowed to use whiteout in your journal or should you draw a line through it and rewrite it on the next line? Um, the second option there. Yeah, you don't want to use white dot, um, any type of correction fluid 
Um, best practice, if you make a mistake, even if it's as simple, simple as maybe you put the wrong number for the type of act, it's recommended you put a line through the entire entry, rewrite it on the next available line, and in the remarks section, you can write corrected entry. I'm wondering if Angela shared her picture of our screen. I'm not, I'm not going to open that, but. That's what it was, yeah. Oh, did you open it? No, she, underneath, she said okay. it was screen. <laughs> Oh, I see it now. <laughs> how, how far ahead of time um, can we apply for renewal? Well, the state will allow your application or they'll take it three months before your commission expires. Um, they want it at least 60 days before your commission expires. Uh, I think what we're recommending now is the three month mark. So before that three month mark, you can schedule your education and then get everything into PAN if you're a PAN member. So we can review it, make sure everything's okay, and then send it off to the state on your behalf. All right. So, uh, will the test be given during or after the first class for new people? It's going to be given after the um, education, but it's not the same day. It's not like you take the three hours and then you stay after class and then take the exam. Um, the exam is something that needs to be scheduled a few weeks after the fact because the state needs to approve your application. And then you actually go to a test, you'll schedule it on the website through a company called Pearson View and you go in person to a testing location and take the exam. Um, so that is something that's done after the fact. Okay, another question from Marissa. Are there stipulations about what type of ink to use in your journal? There are not. Um, my recommendation, use uh, a permanent ink. Don't use something that can be erased. Also, I would use a color like black or blue uh, that could easily be photocopied if anyone ever requested a copy of your journal because the state can do that. Um, Colors like blue and pink and, excuse me, pink and green and yellow are probably not your, your safest bets. Um, Nathan said an earlier question from Claire, I think was not answered about assessing an elderly person's understanding. So Brian went in good detail on that, but I could definitely maybe piggyback off it or kind sure. of just reiterate what he was mentioning. So. If you have any doubts about the elderly on whether or not they understand what's going on, um, that actually falls on you, the notary. You need to make sure they understand what's going on. So you, instead of asking your customer, hey, do you understand what you're signing here? What it's a good practice is ask them an open-ended question. So put the ball in their court, say, hey, well, how's this document going to affect you? And then if they can explain the document to me, on what's going on in the situation, whether they're given power for someone to handle their financials, whether they're just giving them power to sell a vehicle, whatever it may be, then I understand or I feel better about their understanding. If you have any doubts, ounce of doubt, I would not notarize. I would refuse to notarize. But nice. in those it's situation, not, ask open-ended questions. It's not, it's not like the, the kinds of questions you might get uh, from, from a neurologist in a hospital where they're trying to assess if you understand where you are, what your surroundings like, what year is it, who's the president? Those, those questions aren't really going to help in a case like this. Can I notarize for a spouse if there is no financial interest? I'm assuming, Catherine, that you are asking about your own spouse. The way the law reads, you cannot notarize if either you or your spouse has a direct or a financial interest in the document. So if you benefit directly or financially, you can't notarize. If your spouse benefits directly or financially, you can't notarize. I'm not gonna say that there is no document in the world that your spouse could sign that you don't, you don't have a direct or financial interest in or that he doesn't have a direct or financial interest in, but I can't imagine what that document would be. I, I suppose you could find one. That's what I, it's it really hard for me to draw up a, a scenario where if it's my document, I don't have an interest that, you know, if I'm named in a document, I have an interest. Hello. That's the way I always look at it. Absolutely. <clears throat> I think Lisa 
maybe hit enter by mistake early. It says someone no longer wants to be a notary and lets their... How about lets their commission expire? Yeah, let's go with that. What would you do? I'm thinking that's what she's maybe thinking. Yeah, I bet. Um, yeah, within 30 days, you need to fill out a resignation form and send it off to the Department of State, um, letting them know you're no longer a notary. And then, yep, there we go. <laughs> um, and then you would need to destroy your stamp so it can't be used to backdate documents and journals that you have kept over the years. From the time you start as a notary to the time you retire, you wanna keep your journals because you need to turn them in when you resign or retire to the recorder deeds where you last maintained an officer record. And I wanna thank Pamela for her kind comments about our no notary wording handout. Uh, we are still having, are we still having to use the stamp on all notaries? Uh, Terry, yes, when you notarize, you are placing your official stamp down every single time. Follow up to the spouse questions. How will that work if I'm becoming the issuing agent for my husband's LLC dealership? So there are some exceptions to the direct interest. Um, off the top of my head, I can't say them. I know they're a part of the notary law. Um, I know there's for salary, salary, hourly wage, or notary fees, but also there's some other exceptions to the direct interest. Um, what I could do is if Brian, you want to look at either look it up or I'll look it up and get them the exceptions. You're, you're killing me, John. I just have to stop <laughs> sharing so I can get, so I <laughs> know I can show my task bar. Hold on. There is it. There we go. Now I can go look for it. Give me just a second. Okay, it's be, here they are. I got it. Oh, you have it? Yeah. Being a shareholder, here's the exceptions. Being a shareholder in a publicly traded company, that is a part of the notarization. Being an officer, director, or employee of a company. Um, or if you're receiving a fee that's not contingent, contingent upon the completion of the notarization. What I would do that is this, um, honestly, if you have doubts or if you're concerned, Marissa, I would contact an attorney and I would say, hey, because um, I'm going to be going into business with my spouse. I'm going to be the notary, but it is an LLC. A lot of times, if it's a sole proprietorship, we would consider that at least our corporate attorney considers that um, direct interest. If you have an LLC, a corporation, he doesn't. Um, I would look into that before I move in any further. Hey, Carol. So to further the question for the spouse, if your children need something notarized and you have no interest, uh, can you notarize it? I was, I understood that you could not notarize anything for your immediate family. Well, the law doesn't really say anything about family members other than your spouse. Again, it says you, you cannot notarize if either you or your spouse has a direct or financial interest in the transaction, the document, whatever. So that's the consideration. Do you or your husband have any interest whatsoever, directly or financially, in the document that you would be notarizing for one of your children? The answer is yes, you can't notarize. Now, if the answer is no, a lot of people make the decision on their own not to notarize for family because later on down the line, you know, fingers point, and you you did that because you knew you were going to get something even though you weren't so sometimes people take a step back and find another notary and i've heard just in the and this is just for me because i've been a instructor now for about five years but my first couple years at pan i was a customer service rep and i've heard some notaries call in and we've we've talked and they said sometimes documents would get rejected where it's going, especially just related PennDOT, for example, or it draws eyes if the names match. You know, if you're notarizing for your daughter and you guys have the same last name, it, it, it draws eyes. I'm not saying it's wrong, but just where the documents go in, they might have concerns. So that's just something to, to think about as well. Do you, do you understand Maline's question? If you are a business and you don't have a letterhead, is it okay to use their business card and make a copy, making it look like a business letterhead? Um, if you're a business and you don't have Does a letterhead. Does that relate to a question that was already asked? 
I don't think so. Um, I'm not sure what the context is. Yeah, I was gonna say notaries aren't required letterheads. Um, I don't know if you, if that's what you're asking, or I'm not sure. If you could please um, clarify, maybe in the chat box, that'd be great. A comment about from Nathaniel about how a mother was allowed to notarize the closing documents for their house. Uh, Nathan says, maybe this is parsing words, but what about notarizing for one of your children who is a minor where you are still the legal guardian? Is that considered interest? Uh, I, I would think that I have a, a, an interest in every single thing that my minor child does. So personally, I would not notarize for a child, minor or not. And that's, I always say there's a lot of these situations, there's not a true yes or no black and white answer. A lot of shades of gray, like we're coming up with here. Um, out of doubt, if you're having questions on it, better idea, probably have somebody else notarize it. Just says, thanks for the webinar. Maybe can, can have another, can one, have another soon. one very soon. That's our goal. Now I would say this, we start back live um, after Labor Day, our hands are going to be really tied with live seminars. And then we're actually going to continue to do Zoom seminars um, that are state approved as well for your renewal or first time. So we're going to be teaching every single week. So our hands are going to be tied. We're going to do our best. Um, we'd like to get maybe one more out before we hit the road, but we will see how that, how that goes. Thank you for the Q&A. You're welcome. We, we do appreciate those comments because... John and I try very hard to stay up to date and <laughs> to be able to, to present the information in an, an understandable manner. For sure. Keep in mind, um, there's no um, survey. A lot of the seminars we do, we do surveys. These webinars are not state approved. This is just more of an informative survey or a, a webinar. But if you could, we're actually doing something relatively new now. Um, we're doing Google reviews. It's just something that helps our company see what services people like about us and, you know, um, what you want to see from us or just the services in general, what we provide. So if you could, if you have a minute, some point today or next week or whenever, leave us a Google review. That would be fantastic. Um, and we appreciate it, honestly. I'm going to throw the link for that in. Oh, thanks, Brian. Well, there you, you go. You, you do need to be signed on to your Google account or it will not allow you to leave a review. We so do we, appreciate we that. We love the great everybody. comments. Even after, 18, the even after 18 years, I like that one. Even after 18 <laughs> years, I still learn new things, which is great. Paris I'm says, glad you for the know. webinar. Is there a way I could prove that I attended? It was a private question. This is not state approved, Tara. So we don't have like a certificate or anything on the on the matter. If you want to email us at instructors at notary.org, we could always type up a sentence or two mentioning that you were here for for you know the webinar. But other than that, that's not there's not much more we could provide. Miriam has a question about PennDOT and underage customers. PennDOT does not have an age specification about a person titling a vehicle. I have always turned customers away who are under 18 because of the need for notarization on some documents. Every single time they have told me some places do it, are those businesses breaking the law regarding notary, notary requirements? They are not, they are not. You are permitted to notarize uh, title, title work for someone who is under the age of 18. Now businesses have their reasons for not selling motor vehicles to those that are under the age of 18. And I'm not going to get into that, but as far as you're concerned, as a notary public or as an agent, you can perform those notarizations. Yeah, I mean, you could do title, they could title a car to a, an eight-year-old. <laughs> You're not gonna be able to register it um, in their name, but yeah, you could definitely title it. A lot of thank yous. No, thank you. I mean, we, we're coming up on that hour mark. We got about five minutes left, so. If you have any questions, now is the time um, because we will be shutting down here very shortly. So we'll probably have a few more questions to answer. A lot of good, diverse questions, tons of topics we've been covering. So this is great. I'm going to pop the email address in there one more time. Awesome.
Yep. Any questions? That is a shared email address between myself and Brian. You will get an answer from one of us, if not both of us, if we hit send at the same time. That happens a lot. <laughs> time to go to the website and check out the offered classes. There you go, Sheena. <laughs> Especially the live ones that start in in um, in September. We are John and I are both actually looking forward to traveling again. It's nice to travel, but it's abbreviated because we're not always on the road like we were in the past. We're still doing those, those Zoom seminars, and for those, we'll be, we'll be at home. So regarding the under 18, I had a father that wanted to put his five-year-old on a title. Mm, again, <laughs> can you title it in the father's name and the five-year-old's name? You can, if the five-year-old has identification that is acceptable to PennDOT, yes. But I doubt very seriously that that <laughs> five-year-old has any one of the pieces of identification uh, that's acceptable to PennDOT. That's the thing. Like notarization, it's different. You know, ID that's required for a will is different than ID that PennDOT will take. There's only five or six things that PennDOT take. So um, much different than just your standard notarization. <laughs> and Catherine, about whether or not these are going to be offered on a regular basis, these webinars. John and I both agree that we love doing this. I think we love doing this sometimes more than teaching because it's, yeah. it's really a different kind of a, uh, it's a different kind of a format for us. A lot of freedom in it. Um, with the travel that's going to be occurring starting in September, it's probably going to be kind of hard to do a lot of these, but we, we're probably going to try to get one more on the books before the end of August. So puts a, it puts some, pressure, puts some pressure on us to think of something to do, but it's, hey, any suggestions? First time, yeah, first time we've done an interactive one, and it seems like even from the other two to this one, it seems like a lot of people enjoy the interactive aspect of it, um, kind of quizzing you, and then opening up the floor to Q&A and then we could talk about it. So I, I would um, definitely do this again. The same kind so. of I think format. a part two might be in the in the works. How about that? Um, Altoona, I think that's Brian. Is that you, Brian? Or is that I me? I don't know. I, I'd have to look at my schedule. <laughs> it's one of us. <laughs> my calendar is somewhere else. Yeah, mine too. I, it's one of us, 100%, because we're only two instructors right now up there. And I honestly, do I have the system signed on? I do not. So I don't even have the database pulled up. I try to keep as many things off the screen as I can when I'm doing um, these webinars, because it it's very difficult when you go to share your screen and you, and you can't find what you're sharing because there's 25 windows that are open on your desktop. We're coming to our final minute here. So what I'm just going to do is say this again, if you enjoyed today, you want to see more webinars, you enjoy just pan services. If you could just do us a favor, let us know what you think on, on Google. That's something new that we just started recently. We appreciate it. I like to say thanks for stopping by. The more participation, the better. These are always enjoyable for us. Have a great weekend. Um, stay safe out there and we will definitely see you next time. See you next time. Thanks for, thanks for coming. Bye, everybody. Goodbye.